Welcome to the Alex Merced Cast, where Alex Merced of alexmerced.com brings you principled, thoughtful, libertarian commentary on issues that matter. Let me tell you guys about the great services over there at Amazon.com. Not only is there Amazon Prime, which gets you two-day free shipping, along with a host of media and music that you can access through your Prime subscription, but you can also subscribe to Audible and get cool audiobooks and get a free audiobook every month, along with Kindle Unlimited. It's like the Netflix for ebook. You can read as many ebooks as you want every month for a monthly subscription. And get a free trial to any of these services by heading over to amazon.alexmerced.com. That's amazon.alexmerced.com. Not only can you get subscriptions or free trials to these products, but you can also find recommended product lists such as recommended books and other cool stuff over there at amazon.alexmerced.com. Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced and you are listening to the Alex Merced cast. And today we're going to be trying a slightly different format. I'm going to try to be doing sort of three-part episodes from here on out where there's basically three topics that I talk about um, in more briefer form. So we'll see how, how this works. If you guys enjoy the show, please do uh, leave a comment, leave a positive review um, on your favorite podcatcher. It does help. I do appreciate it. And of course, um, when you hear the ads, go out there and take advantage of these offers and deals it helps me set the side of time to do this. It's very much appreciated. Now, the topics I have today is first we're gonna talk about sort of uh, organizational struggle. And this is in the context of my experience with the Libertarian Party and other organizations I've been, with, been in, and just talking about how a lot of these struggles, a lot of these sort of fights are not novel. Um, it's not something that's unique to the Libertarian Party. It's something you can see across many organizations. In the second segment today, we're gonna be talking about feeling safe and over criminalization. Um, just talking about how kind of over criminalization has created an environment where we, we're just scared of each other. Um, and in the third segment, I will be sort of readdressing the whole uh, Justin Amash leaving the Republican Party once again, um, just because of some recent news updates. So I just want to kind of talk about that a little bit more. So first topic, organizational structure, struggle. So this is one of the reasons why I'm really into not just, you know, I, I, if you follow me for a long time, you know I'm into like Austrian economics and just economics as a whole. But there's a segment of economics called institutional economics, the new institutional economics, uh, economics of corporate governance. This is like a whole field of economics that doesn't even really look at government policy, um, some of it, especially the corporate governance stuff. It just more looks at how organizations are set up and what kind of incentives does it create? Um, does it create incentives that lead to sort of aligning interests versus malaligning interests, etc. So at the end of the day, being like whether it's government, a corporation, a charity or whatnot, determining that just the existence of the organization and the individual, the existence of the organization doesn't necessarily determine uh, success or the fact that it's in a free market, but also all these aspects that are internal to the organization as far as how are leaders chosen, who gets to make decisions and what do they make decisions about? Um, what does that do to the incentives of those because of the way these decisions are made, what does that do for incentives for individuals within those organizations? And this is, I think, a, a body of knowledge or a body, a discussion that doesn't happen enough. The reason being is it doesn't have so much policy implications more than organizational implications. So instead of it, so when you read this stuff, it's not so much about, okay, what should government do? Although people like um, Elizabeth Warren do th do you take stuff from it and be like, okay, well, then we need to have policy to force people to do these things that seem to be good. Problem is, again, one size fits all. Just because it's good for one organization or a handful of organizations doesn't mean it's good for every organization. So a lot of like uh, Elizabeth Warren's corporate governance policies along those lines um, of trying to put some of these things into code, although some of it seems to be more just sort of what she intuits would be good versus what sort of part of the literature um, or just sort of appeals towards appeals to labor and whatnot. Um, so there's a very interesting body of knowledge and I'll probably actually come back to in future episodes and actually delve into it and go into uh, some of the findings and literature on it because it, it's useful um, in any group that you're in it's going to be useful and if you run a business you run a charity or you even get into government these are going to be things that are going to allow you to make these organizations better function better, um, address certain problems, etc. 
So you could literally have two businesses with the same product and one could have different outcomes because of its governance structure, et cetera. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And the reason being is that in the Libertarian Party, we have a very transparent governance structure. So at the top of the national organization is what's called the Libertarian National Committee. I'm the vice chair of the Libertarian National Committee. It's like being um, the vice chairman of a corporate board. Okay, so I fill in when the chair cannot fulfill their duties for whatever reason, which isn't very often. So basically, I'm, I'm, I'm just the second guy. Uh, <laughs> although I try to be visible and a positive uh, figure within the, within the organization, just for organizational morale. But that's something more that I choose to take on more than something that is part of my, um, my job description as vice chair. But the Libertarian National Committee, we are very transparent compared to other political organizations. So, for example, the Republican National Committee, they have meetings, they have minutes, um, but they're not necessarily as easy to find far as, and their email communications aren't as easy to find if, if they're even accessible at all. While the Libertarian Party, you can literally just go to the Libertarian Party website and you can actually look at all the emails that we send to each other through our, our committee list. And, you can, and then we generally communicate. Uh, <laughs> and generally, if members try to communicate off the list, generally other members will push back and make sure that information ends up on the list. So it's very transparent. You can literally see the arguments. You can get a feel for the personalities of the different members of the Libertarian Party's National Committee. So a lot of people will watch this and they get very frustrated by it because they're like, oh, well, you know, people want, always like want to appear that everything is, you know, that we're, everything is a united front. No organization truly is. Behind the scenes, there are always sort of political struggles, differences of strategy, differences versus how the process should be. People want to go into different directions. Um, that's politics. Politics exists not just in government, but in all organizations. Um, the only difference is the Libertarian Party is much more transparent about it. But I think that's not a bad thing. Um, while it can seem a little messy because you get to see how the meat is made, it's kind of like, you know, if you had an open concept. If you go to one of those restaurants where you can actually literally see, you know, how the food is made and see the food being made, when mistakes happen, you can see it. Um, you get to see all the stuff that, you know, you might not get to see at other restaurants. But it does give you a level of comfort, okay? Seeing that the food is made right in front of you makes you feel feel comfortable that, hey, you know, this was used clean plates. Um, you know, the chef was focused on, on doing a good job, didn't do anything dirty, nothing fell on the floor, um, all that kind of stuff. And that, that has a value to it. So in the sense that when you get to see the LNC list, despite you having to see all these arguments and, 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 and squabbles and whatnot, you know, at least you know that we are challenging each other. You know that there is discourse, there is debate. Um, there are people who are who push on different threads. Okay, no one pushes on everything. That's why you need a committee because different people are going to prioritize process over strategy, strategy over process, mission over uh, X, Y, and Z. Okay, uh, tactics over strategy. Uh, people are going to have different priorities, and you basically having a group. This is why corporations have boards, um, why there's a legislature, because literally the, the, the Congress is essentially the board of directors of the country. And the president's more like the CEO, in a sense. The only difference is, and then the only difference being that instead of the CEO being appointed by the board, um, the CEO is voted on by the shareholders, which is different than how most corporations would handle that. Um, which, again, would have governance implications, which is, goes back to that whole you know, idea of corporate governance. So the point is the transparency is not bad. It gets people to feel more comfortable that the process is honest. Uh, but also, it makes it harder for us to get things done. This is true, okay? Um, when you can't sit there, when you can't just do non-transparent um, backroom dealing kind of stuff, it's hard, it's hard. It's harder to grease the wheels to get things done. This is what happens in Congress. People grease the. They'll sit there and say, "Hey, you know what? Um, you know, I'll put this money for your district in this bill if you vote for it." Now, if all of us saw that kind of exchange and that sort of willing dealing in public, there'd be a lot more public outcry, and there would, it would probably be harder for Congress to get a lot of things done. Okay, same thing with the Federal Reserve and monetary policy. Transparency does make it harder to do things efficiently or quickly because 
you can't people who are roadblocks you can't kind of just deal with them quietly um, in not necessarily the cleanest ways but that's not a bad thing okay especially when you're talking about large top of top of the pyramid kind of organization so in the sense of the lnc is the national governing body in the libertarian party among many smaller organizations the state organizations the county organizations because we can it's a little bit hard for us to get stuff done generally only stuff that gets done is stuff that with major sort of consensus which is good because if we were to just do everything that anyone ever had a whim to do you'd be making a lot of impositions, putting in a lot of obligations on state organizations and county organizations that they may or may, may, or may not be able to handle. Um, on top of it, you'd be end up having to focus those state and local organizations to focus on things that are, that are not what they wanted to focus on, which they arguably would have done better because that's, what they, that's where their heart is. So basically it prevents sort of that top-down apparatus from really stifling the bottom-up uh, goodness, and that's kind of how the the way the country has done so well. Why the U.S. has has grown the way it has because um, you've had the um, the bottom up structure, basically from the individual, the county, the state, bearing the bur the bearing the brunt of the burden over the last couple hundred years. Now, yes, there have been situations where there was unfortunate consensus, and the government, the federal government, was able to claim a little bit more power, and it has slowly and surely claimed more power and the ability to do things more unilaterally to everyone's detriment. But the fact that it took so long isn't the bad thing. You know, it's hard to prevent power from consolidating, but having transparency, having accountability can definitely help it from doing so. And and you get a lot of benefit and allows you to grow a lot faster because of it. And now we see ourselves growing slower as a country because a lot of that has dissipated. The Libertarian Party has grown quite a bit because everything is so decentralized and, and a lot of the action is not at the national level, but at the state and county level. Um, while you get some periphery support at national. So that's what I want to kind of say about there. So the point is, I like the way the Libertarian Party works. I think a lot of people take for granted how much we've grown since we started. I mean, 40 years isn't a very long time in the grand scheme of things. And there's been a lot of barriers that we've had to overcome in those 40 years that didn't exist prior to those 40 years. Um, it, we're still, we've still grown to be the largest, you know, the largest, the third largest party in the United States and um, are still growing, which is something that the other parties cannot say. We are still, you know, we still have a long way to go, but the trajectory is good and, and the rate of growth is good and, a lot, and it's not by accident. So um, decentralization works. The Libertarian Party is a free market for uh, libertarian activism and libertarian political action, and that's why I think it works, because free markets help us learn and be resilient and nimble. So I'll see you guys in the next after the next break. Have a good one till then. Let me tell you about many of the great offers over there at offers.alexmerced.com. That's offers.alexmerced.com, where you can find great offers for things like NordVPN, so that way you can browse the internet privately in a world where privacy matters more than ever. Or as Bluehost, a great hosting software or great hosting service that you can get at a very affordable price through our offer. Check that and more over there at offers.alexmerced.com to find great offers for you today. And I'm back, and now we're going to talk about criminalization. Because basically, here's what happens. There was a recent situation where um, there was some cops over there at Starbucks, and they were just drinking some coffee, and one of the other customers said they didn't feel safe with them there. So they asked Starbucks to ask them to leave, and they, the Starbucks did. They asked the cops to, to leave. And this is kind of a weird situation, you know? Um, when sort of the people you imagine are there are supposedly there to make you feel safe, don't make you feel safe. And people want to make it this sort of more of a racial issue and whatnot, but it's, it's part of a grander problematic trend of over-criminalization. When you start, the, at the end of the day, law enforcement enforces what they're told to enforce. Now, yes, yeah, sometimes they enforce it unfairly. Sometimes they use the enforcement to punish political enemies and reward political allies by not enforcing on it less. But all of this relies on the fact that there's something to enforce. So the more crimes there are, the more rooms there is for 
unfair enforcement, the more room there is for political favoritism um, and other things. Okay, and of course there are the cops who enforce things fairly and, and the way they should be, and may, and make judgment calls based on, you know, uh, from a place of compassion, not from a place of sort of personal gain um, or personal prejudice. But again, that level of discretion is always going to exist in enforcement. So you don't want necessarily the enforcement to be needed as often as possible, uh, which is sort of the world we've kind of moved into today where basically we make more and more things crimes. We make more and more things things that are subject to legal enforcement um, that create more situations in where there's enforcement actions, where basically you have to interact with police, not in a, oh, hey, hey, officer, have a great day, kind of, but because you know, you did X, Y, or Z, and sometimes you're not even aware of X, Y, or Z as a crime. The problem is there are so many things that are crimes nowadays, most people aren't aware if they're causing a problem anymore. So everyone, especially if you're someone who's part of a traditionally less powerful class, economically or ethnically or culturally, um, you know, you're gonna be scared. But I mean, but literally it's a fear that everyone shares nowadays because no one knows what it is that's gonna trigger a, a enforcement interaction. And because there's so many more of those, because there's so many more things that are crimes and problems and whatnot, um, whether it's enforcing licensing rules, different business regulations, health code violations, stuff like that, all these different things kind of create these situations where you never know the cops there that bother you because you, don't, cause you weren't aware that you did something wrong because there's so many things that are now wrong. Um, so over-criminalization creates this environment where we are scared of each other, where, we, where, where you know, you create the schism between enforcement and then enforcement ends up being scared because they're scared of people being scared of them. And this creates a fear and this creates the environment uh, that leads to sort of much more tragic enforcement interactions and also just this sort of division that we're seeing in society. So something to think about. I think it's time to really start reversing criminalization creep and start saying, do all these things need to be crimes? So I'll see you guys after the break. If you appreciate my efforts to provide you with educational, enlightening, and entertaining content, please do consider becoming a supporter by heading over to donate.alexmerced.com. That's donate.alexmerced.com, where you can find several options to support my efforts, whether by becoming a patron over there at patreon.com, which gives you access to exclusive Facebook groups and exclusive content. Also, you can also become a subscriber through Bitbacker through a monthly cryptocurrency donation. You can also find cryptocurrency donation addresses and PayPal link for one-time donations over there at donate.alexmerced.com. This allows me to be able to set aside the time to continue creating free content that educates, enlightens, and entertains. Thank you very much. This is Alex Merced from alexmerced.com, mercedbranding.com. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Now, we're back to the show, and I want to talk very briefly about Justin Amash in the sense that uh, Justin Amash is now... Announced that since he's become independent, since he's left the GOP, which I talked about a few episodes ago, um, that he's going to run for re-election, which is a, which is what people should have expected. I mean, I know a lot of people want Justin Amash to run for president, whether as an independent or with the Libertarian Party. Um, the problem is that it's it's that's a very tall hill to climb, um, and it would turn out to be generally would probably turn out to be a hill you die on. You might be able to position yourself for. A, for something in the future if it goes well, but also if it doesn't go well and, and is very underwhelming um, or it shows no real improvement, it could also be something that slides you back and sort of really puts a nail in the coffin. And Justin Amash seems like someone who would really, if possible, want to hold on to the influence he already has as a member of Congress. So it would make sense for him that he's gonna continue to try to find a way to run. So in this case, he gets to not have to worry about a primary and have to pivot to the right for a primary and just focus on building consensus among his district uh, as an independent. Um, and this could al this is also a tall hill to climb, but it also go sh it'll allow him to focus on building a sort of, we focus on sort of the larger electorate over the next year, which will improve his chances versus, again, pivoting to the right in a primary and then suddenly getting hit hard from the left and losing the general election. So this is uh, probably strategically the smart move for him. Uh, but again, Justin Mash, definitely someone I have a lot of respect for. I wish him the best. I will see you guys on the next episode. Have a great day and enjoy. 
Thank you for listening to the Alex Merced cast. Learn more at alexmerced.com, libertarian101.com, and libertarianwingmedia.com. Follow Alex Merced on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook.